the future of the city is very much the future of the nature and uh, that we need to take in consideration many of these things about the actions of the future and how the cathedral wealth is probably the way to to think of the future because there are some actions that probably we won't see and the next generation needs to follow in order to be better than we are today. So I don't know, Lucia, since you do public policies and research and all that, if you'd like to tell us what do you think and probably as you feel Craig or Alex could be following her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, go on, carry on, please. So I think that um, in terms of public policy, we need to consider what are the main challenges that we face, right? Because a city that is a smart city has to take into consideration all of the people that live in that city and also all of the people that are moving from um, the periphery to the big cities and how that is also affecting how we use technology and how that technology is being um is being politicized to some extent and also how that technology is actually making sure that people are getting what they need and if we're talking about exactly what you were talking about the connection between nature and the cities or where, we're, where we live in we're coming into this um challenge of how we how we become more sustainable but at the same time, how we harness that technology to make sure that people that are living in the cities and outside of the big cities are getting what they need. Um, so I think that uh, for our, uh, from our experience at Sea Minds, uh, we're focusing on these projects that are connecting these two dots on how we can become more sustainable through um, these initiatives that are tackling and. Um, trying to um, include the community that is part of the creation of the city. Um, so how, how much are we connecting the dots between the government, um, the scientists, and the people that are creating the new things for the city? So I, I know that you and uh, Craig and Alex as architecture, architecture, architects and as creators of these huge venues that probably provide um, this cultural side into different cities and this connection between nature and the needs, the basic needs, um, we'll know more about. So I'm going to give the microphone to either of you, Alex or Craig. Uh, I, I, I would like to say one thing that you, I, I'll pick up on one thing that you said, Lucia, about uh, the people in this city. Because I mean, we can, we can compartmentalize all of the functions of a city. You know, it needs its transportation, it needs its communication systems, it needs its water and its sewage and its traffic and all of those things. They're just component elements of the functionality of a city. They're not the heart of a city. And you, you mentioned the people. And one of the things that I think um, that is fundamental to any city is that it, if it doesn't have the engagement of its, of its the population, you know, where they've got a pride in the city, where the city is a cultural roots, they can fall back on history. We're doing projects in Saudi Arabia, like for instance, in Neom, where they're building new cities. Those new cities will have no, uh, cultural root, really. They're just going to be new cities and they're going to, everything's going to work. It's all going to be fantastic for them. But then you come back to your roots and go, how does it work for me? How does it work for me, the individual? So we think about cities this big, but in fact, cities are about individuals and how those individuals live in, in those communities. For me, it's for, I'll give you a quick anecdote and I'm going to let Craig talk. But I remember uh, meeting with Nehemiah in Rio and he a fantastic individual, fantastic architect. And he drew with one pencil the, the profile of the city along the river. Never took his pen off the paper and just went and made all those shapes. And I went, that's really clever. But what he's done is he's just drawn kind of landmark buildings on an elevation without the 
anything beyond that. And I'm like, there must be something beyond that. And so, you know, working with Craig, I see that, you know, Snaheta are a company that thinks beyond the building. That's a lead down, Craig. <laughs> well, certainly humans uh, are an extremely port important part of the world we live on. We, we are dynamic, we, we are energized, we, we uh, constantly are, are changing and manipulating not only ourselves, but the world around us. So the, the, the context of human beings is, is crucial. On the other hand, it's also kind of odd because, you know, as humans, we tend always to reflect on ourselves as if we're the most important thing. Um, religions do that. Uh, even science occasionally does that and places the human at the center of all uh, uh, discussions. Uh, I even saw a map one time of the universe, uh, known universe as is understood today. And of course, right in the middle of it was the earth, you know, as if we're in the center, even of the universe, you know, we, it's just a little bit insane. Um, so sometimes trying to pull ourselves away from the direct understanding of uh, what we need as people and understand the consequences of our actions upon those things that don't care about us directly uh, is also very intriguing. Um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, right now we're experiencing what happens when we ignore the consequences of what we need and, and, and what, uh, what effect that has on the world. Now, this is not a new discussion. So the notion of climate abuse, which is what I call climate change, I call it climate abuse, has been around for decades. But actually the challenge with climate abuse discussions, climate uh, temperature change, uh, all of those things, rising seawaters, they're kind of existential to most people. They take centuries or decades. That they take a long time for you to really see what's happening before you get frightened. And humans uh, react better in crisis than they do in, in, pre in planning for the future. So we're kind of waiting for this crisis to happen and then it's, you know, it's gonna be all hands on deck, I'm sure. But right now we're in this existential period. On the other hand, the pandemic that we're facing, which is essentially a biological hazard, it's a biological catastrophe. Um, in much in the same way that we have inv other environmental catastrophes like hurricanes and things. That happened in an instant. Literally within a few months, we saw the effect of what it means to displace habitat, for example, in China with manufacturing where the poor little creatures like bats live where these diseases originate. And we saw that just that bit of, uh, of challenge to their habitat and their uh, sense of biodiversity, within a short period of time, the entire world is destabilized and paralyzed, unlike climate change that takes decades. So uh, in a sense, we're having to look not only at the value of our own culture, which Alex, you mentioned, and the, our needs in terms of infrastructure that you're mentioning, Lucia, we also have to look at those peripheries, and, and uh, Maurizio brought it up very well, that the city is nature and nature is the city. They're not two separate things. And, and have identify how we can start to soften the connections between uh, the edges of our cities and the edges of the habitat where humans don't live in, in density. And uh, I, I really can't uh, overstate how important that is now. These poor little little bats who live in their little caves, they didn't mean us any harm. But you know, we built in uh, industrialization of farm and agricultural life that's pushed away their insect uh, uh, diets. We pushed into their forest lands with more development of light manufacturing and other needs and infrastructure just so we can serve the cities that we're trying to protect or, and build around us. So uh, I just want to kind of leave it. Another, leave it another layer to add to that is, um, before we actually get in a little bit deeper into how the cities work really, is that um, I remember 40 years ago when I was working with a guy called James Gardner. And he said, you know, the biggest single problem that um, people are not focusing in on, I mean, because the pandemics are kind of like, boom, they come at you. And you've got to try and be ready for them, but you don't know when they're going to happen. But as you know, they are going to happen, though, I guess. Yeah, you know they're going to happen. <laughs> um, um, and, but, but 
when he reflected, he went, the biggest single thing that people are going to need to deal with is migrations of people. And, that, and then the distribution of wealth, uh, we see it in Europe, you see it coming out of Mexico and America. That distribution, that distribution of wealth actually distorts the global pattern of the way we should all be living. If we all want to try and live in the same planet and enjoy the same benefits of the planet, then you know cities and the way we live has got to look at how we deal with migration. Yeah, but, and, but does that mean you're saying we shouldn't migrate? No, I'm saying that, that the, the nations with the haves should look at the have-nots and try and make the place where the have-nots come from a better place to live, better society. So we should be trying it, to... It's hard to disagree with, uh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to harm people, but yeah. saying that there are haves and have-nots is also a complicated question because, I mean, I would say Mexico has more haves than it has have-nots, except it's just not a strong economy in, in the way that America has. But, you know, they have a cultural life. They have a, a lot of beauty in Mexico that you just don't get. And, and, and furthermore, for someone from the U.S. to tell them how to protect that, for example would be strange yeah, to me. Yeah, no, no, you're 100% right. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm, I mean, you know, there's massive culture and history and pride in the arts and all of that in places like Mexico and in Africa. I'm talking about the people in poverty. Economies, people, yeah. The economy. Yeah well, yeah, well, in that case, definitely, because uh, strong economies tend to take advantage of weak economies and they push people in a cap using capitalism as a core they push weaker economies into serving the stronger economies. And that's definitely a serious problem. But that's separate to me than, than migration because we, we've, always, we've always had migration on this planet. And it's true that the, the faster we move, the faster a pandemic spreads. And you know that's the other thing about this. By the way, here's an interesting little, little fact that I, I, I've been uh, fascinated by, strangely coincidental, but also valuable to understand. I was talking earlier about bats uh, and, and the source of this current pandemic. There are only two mammals, mammals that can fly, that are capable of sustained flight, a bat and a human. They do it naturally, we do it artificially, but we're the only two mammals that can keep ourselves in the air for sustained flight. And it's that mobility, that movement. It's not necessarily migration, but it's how fast you move and what you need to move with. And you're working with mobility, Alex, so that's really interesting to me. That's where a lot of these challenges occur in terms of hazards. Um, there's nothing wrong with walking across the planet, per se, but flying around 50,000 flights a day, and you know, that's a different issue. <laughs> this has to do also with the, the emotion of being part of something. Because the boredom of being isolated is the other component that others. Do you think it's boring? Well, I think uh, people get bored in cities. For most people, it could be, <laughs> and that, that's when they are in the fields. They feel like need to go where the action is. Plus, of course, the economy magnet. And uh, what is clear is the trend of the migration is coming very fast, and will be three quarters of the global population in cities very soon. And uh, and, and I think the I, I think it's propaganda. It's not you. Don't, I, in my opinion, and, and I'm maybe in a small small world here, but all of that stuff that everyone says cities are good for, yes, they are, but they're not better than, uh, for example, a, a rural or agricultural environment. So I've been into Africa, into the eastern parts of Guinea. And you find small villages, they have an economy. It's just not with dollars and coins or whatever the hell else it is we invented. They, they barter, they trade, they have a strong economy. They have entertainment. They, they don't have to live with everyone looking at what they do. They've developed mechanisms to find privacy. They have all of those things. Yet still, people are getting sucked into the cities. And I think a big part of it, I hate to say it, is the propaganda that we, for example, are presenting even partially here that suggests that cities are the future. Cities are important, really important. Actually, you, they're you, not you the future. hit on a good point here about the pandemic and how it's affected. I can only speak for London because I live in London. And I can look at the impact of the pandemic on the inner city. So 
you know, there are layers. We've got London has its inner city, then its outer city, and then beyond that, the counties. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the field forests, all of that, but we've got an inner, a huge city, and the core of it is losing its people. People are not going there because the pandemic has scared them away. The offices are closing down. So there's a revaluation of office space. Do we need all, do we need Canary Wharf? Do we need places of that kind of scale functioning in within a, an inner city uh, to feed the rest as it were? And the problems with that is if you move, if you move the big companies out of the inner city, all the people in the inner city that survive on it as much as the people in the rural areas survive on the city to supply, the people in the inner cities, they're dying because there is no one migrating into the cities on a daily basis and going back out and in. So there's a complete reevaluation of how the core of the city works, let alone the rest. And this pandemic is kind of threw it up of well, it has how we live in a city. Oh, sorry. Maybe Lucia wants to say something. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <Go ahead. laughs> I, I, I actually think that, um, you know, what Craig is saying regarding how we are considering the city like to be the most important. Um, it's, it's also sort of how we've been educated in the city to think. Yeah. Um, and actually at Sea Mines, we ran a project that was a six, six, um, six months project that was um, especially to like educate people on how to use tools in the agricultural um, rural communities to improve their, um, yeah, to improve their processes, but not necessarily to make them move away and migrate towards the city, but to use those technology also to know how to improve their own community and their own culture. So I do believe that there is like um, discrepancy between what we call a city of the future, which actually is what right now has us in a pandemic and in like very difficult situations as humanity. Um, as Craig was saying, like to, f to be able to fly from here to Australia, even during a situation that is like a crisis, a global crisis. And for people that are part of the rural communities that probably don't have that level of knowledge that people in the poor cities do, um, it's terrible because I think that the education can be translated into how as humans we are gathering the information and I think it reflects into like a very much more philosophical way of thinking on how we as humans are actually treating each other um, in the humanity of what's important for the cities to work. And I do believe that we can use and harness technology to make sure that cities, both um, the big cities and more the rural communities can be um, you know, can, can be can become better, um, especially going into this how we how we harness the technology to become more sustainable in our cities and not have this um, terrible uh, things like climate change, right? Like, what are we doing in our day to day basis in the cities in terms of governments, in terms of um, the decision makers to make sure that everybody's being taken care of. There's a great movie I want to recommend people to see. And if, if you, maybe you have seen it, I'm not sure. And I'm sorry for my pronunciation. It's an indigenous uh, name from, the, from Guatemala. Um, Ixcanul, I-X-C-A-N-U-L. In English, it's called the volcano, I think. And I think that's yeah. the name of it. Have you seen, has anyone seen that? I, I've seen it. It's a it's powerful film. It's so beautiful, but it's also a little bit sad. Like I find oh, it's how, very sad. I, I find how, I find really hard to um, understand how also we can be part of this movement, this global movement that is making the cities um, the future, no, right? In terms of mobility, in terms of how we're connecting everybody to everyone and how that is also, 
um, a risk for other people that are not having the same opportunities yeah. that the and that, people that are in the same. And place. for those who haven't seen the movie, it's it's about a young girl who um, who uh, is lives in a very very tiny community uh, deep into the into the forest uh, indigenous community in Guatemala, and all the young people are getting enticed to go to the city. And of course, it's the young boys who have the most liberty because the young girls are more carefully controlled. And all the young boys are saying, oh, you have to come to the city. It's really cool. It's really cool. And they were quite happy, actually. This family and everybody was really happy. But she gets into this, I won't tell you what, but into the story of being dragged to the city and terrible things happen. And uh, and you wonder, what, you know, why? why? Why couldn't they have just... And, you know, it was the propaganda that sucked them out of their world. And, uh, you know, that's where I get worried. Yes. The go other ahead. thing, I think, sorry, Mauricio, please. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say about the, the, the kind of holistic approach we take mentally that people take about cities. But the absolute truth is, and we're all saying it, cities are very culturally different. So when you, when you impose yourself, uh, and you, I think Craig's kind of touched on it where, you know, it's not about the individual, um, but it is about the cultural root of, of nations that defines their cities as different from another city. Yeah. What I'm sitting on right now is the social, is about to become the communications hub, the startup hub of, you know, West meets East. That is their plan. That is not the plan of a city in Norway, for instance, or a city in Canada. So cities by their very, by the very definition, doesn't define cities. It doesn't define right. the, what is a city. So there are millions of cities and they're all different. And the one about that movie that you've just made, that is a different scenario from what may happen in Leeds, in, in in the UK. So when we talk about cities, we've got to really understand cities are not the same. Every one of them is as different as the family next door, as it were. You know, the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know the Greek uh, root for the word city is, you probably know the word metropolis. Uh, mm -hmm. Metropolis is a kind of interchangeable, uh, more root, uh, ancient word than, than city even. And metropolis has two roots, metra and uh, polis. Metra is the word for mother, and polis is the word for citizen, which in ancient Greece meant uh, you weren't a slave, you were like a police. Uh, we get the word police in English from that word. It means you have legal rights uh, to yourself and I over others. Funny thing, Craig, just sorry to cut across you, just one moment, I'll give you a little bit of local dialogue. In Scotland, we call the police polis. Yeah, the same. It's even the same spelling. There you go. Yeah. And what I find fascinating is if you take those two uh, words, mother and police, in contemporary terms, they're both things that we feel we need. They protect us, but at the same time, they have total control over our lives. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know, and that's not a good thing either. I mean, it's your mother that sets you up for life. She controls how you a lot when you're a child, and the police manage that for the rest of your life. So those two words actually are not, they're nice words, but they're also very problematic. And, and, and that's where city gets interesting. It's much more nuanced than an ideal. I, I, gave a, a, I, I gave myself a challenge once a while back to figure out what would happen if we densified the entire population of the continental United States into a single city and what might that look like? And basically it's a strip of people that's about, um, I don't know, maybe a kilometer wide that stretches from the East Coast to the West Coast, a thin, thin belt line like that. And then the rest would be no people at all. And I wondered what on earth would that world be like? Um, first of all, it didn't actually make a city because one quarter wide. In this direction, it was not a city. In the other direction, it was like the biggest city on earth, <laughs> you know, because it was like 2000 miles wide, but it was only a quarter of a mile high. And then you start to ask yourself, A, what constitutes a city? Is it really density? Uh, and B, what's going to keep those people in that quarter mile strip from actually moving into all that extra space out there? You know, then you have to tell them how to live and then we have a problem. Uh, so, the, you know, it's, it's intriguing that the city of the future uh, will 
it will deal with a lot of infrastructural issues for sure. But as, as Alex said, how will it deal with what it means to be a human being and a different human being in different places on earth? Yeah, and I think it's uh, the focus of the future that has to do with the, with the well-being of all of us. I think recently, because of this stage that we are at, we are concerned about the future of our neighbor, our friend, and, and we're concerned so they are in good shape, good health, in order to be good as well. And, and I think this concept of the, of the cathedral wealth uh, has to do with that. How, how can we stay better? It has nothing to do with the, if you have the resources of the wealth, it has to do with you, you you need to take care of the same air, the same water and everything. There are all the resources that we live in, in the same way. And I think uh, this, these principles, these values, these ideas of these individuals is what really would define the future of the city and, and, uh, and the harmony that we may have with nature. Because uh, as we know, very little people, every time less people provides more food for most people. And, uh, and we need to take care of that. Uh, and, and that has to do with the mobility. For instance, uh, the products that we eat at the city, half of the price of it has to do with the transportation, pollution, packaging, and, and we need to be aware of that in order to solve it in another way. Well, here's, here's another interesting point then, and that is that cities uh, also have borders and limits. So they have a a ring that's like here uh, le by legal terms on that side of the line is a city and on this side of the line it's not even though sometimes there's no actual physical it's difference based on the post yeah Almost the post office the address. <laughs> that's that's uh, yeah that's probably absolutely cool um but it's it's a weird thing but the point is that we don't we used to build walls around cities because they were defensive uh, rarely do we build walls around them anymore we've transferred the notion of walls to our national borders some countries have like this one and 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 what we have changed is that it used to be that a border was a, only like you say the post office maybe used it uh, as a place to help manage. Like, it's okay to have a border, really. It's not that big of a deal. You can manage different things like post or taxes or whatever. But when you add a wall, it's no longer a border. It's actually a division. It's a segregation. And uh, have you ever read uh, Lives of a Cell? Does anyone know that book by Lewis Thomas? It might have been Scottish. I don't know. Lives of a Cell. You really should check it out. It's this tiny, tiny little book, but it's super great. And he talks about, uh, and it's never been proven that this is true or not, but the story is worth telling anyway. There was a group of people in the Congo who lived deep in, in the forest, and they had lived for generations, centuries you know, of time in, deep in the forest in small nomadic groups, and they were very healthy and very happy and did reasonably well for themselves. And then uh, the, uh, the, the capitalist industrial, industrialist groups started moving into their forest and taking away their natural resources to the point that they were losing their environment. So the government said, well, that's okay, we'll fix it. We'll build this beautiful place here with homes and bathtubs and showers and gardens and lawns, and we'll move them out of their mountains in the forest and put them in these homes and see, aren't we good people? And very quickly, of course, the, their culture collapsed almost within a short period of time. And one of the, one of the uh, side effects of culture collapse was they each had a house and their own territory and they had a yard and a fence. And they would go, if they needed to go to the toilet, they would go to, instead of using the toilet in their house, which they found you know, weird, why would you do that? They'd go to the edge of their yard, hang their butts over the fence and go to the toilet in the neighbor's yard because it was on the other side of the border. And so it, therefore it's not theirs. It's just like, get it out of my property. And now we do that with countries. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, think, I think going back to Maurice's point on how we're taking care of our sustainability in the cities. Um, I also think that there's like a main challenge which is regarding education of everyone, the, the citizens, right? Because yeah. I think that, as we said before, we established that the citizens are the ones that are that create these cities or these communities um, are the central part of the the cities of the future, 
And in the end, if we don't tackle these huge challenges that we as humanity are, are facing right now, like such as climate change, the pandemic, um, and others, like the, the supply of elements and uh, foods for 2050, that is going to be like 70% uh, more than what is currently right now. Um, we need to think about how in the cities we can actually harness that technology and make sure that we are using that for the impact that it can have on the greater amount of people, right? Um, so thinking about that and thinking about how we can make a city that is of the future, not also smarter, but also more and more um, sustainable. I think it's key to make sure that we have um, clean air to breathe. We have like water to drink. We have food in our table. Um, and how do we actually connect those dots um, with everything that we do in terms of culture as well and education? to ensure that we have, that we're tackling that challenge. And I don't know what you think, Alex, about this, or you, Craig, that you create like all of these spaces as well um, that, that basically create this cultural side of it um, alongside with Mauricio as well. I don't know how we could turn that educational side for the citizen and actionable as well, because it's not only about knowing that it's happening, like everybody knows that climate change is happening. Well, some people don't think yeah. so, but yeah, there's, that's there's another a, issue. Some of the dinosaurs were asteroid deniers. <laughs> I learned that. Ah. <laughs> that's another <laughs> issue, but um, in general, like people know that it's there. And however, like, I don't, I don't believe that everybody's doing stuff or taking action on how to tackle climate change from the smallest uh, level, which is in your home, like, are you recycling? Are you reusing? Are you, are you making sure that you are not wasting water? Um, to the bigger stage, which is in the cities, like how are we actually making sure that um, the water, that everybody has access to these basic resources, um, but in a sustainable way? So I don't know if you've seen uh, on Netflix, and I know that this is like such a cliche, but Zac Efron's documentary on um, on like Earth, uh, he traveled around yeah. different cities, and it was very interesting to learn about how what we were saying before, like right, every city is different. There is no one city that is the same as another one, and how each city is taking these um, technologies. Even the basic technologies of creating a well from stones and just a river up to the technologies of how do we um, ensure that all of this um, mobility in terms of like, how do we reduce the carbon emissions and everything is happening. And I saw a really interesting uh, episode on there that Paris, and I didn't know that, and I was in France like a couple of months, well, like a couple of months ago, last year. And um, Paris has water, like but drinkable water for everybody in the city for free. And there is like different, um, different, um, yeah, like um, places where you can go and get water for free um, because the city of Paris is, has actually cleaned, cleansed out um, the main river, um, the, the Seine River, um, to ensure that everybody in the city can have access to water, even if they're in like um, vulnerable situations, right? Um, so I don't know, I, I would like to hear your thoughts I, about that. I swam in the Seine many times. Normally, <laughs> normally when I'm drunk. Yeah, you <laughs> fell off a boat, I think. Yeah, yeah. But... Drunk and swam across it, and it's uh, mm -hmm. I drank it, so it's never poisoned me. But you know, you're making a really good point about um, when I when I think about the cities and the resource that they use. We're always constantly focused on the city, the resource, the buildings, the structures, and we talk less about the stress of the places. And one of the things that we are looking at, I guess, at the moment is uh, harmony and losing the stress of future living. So how do we live with more harmony with ourselves and nature and the technologies and everything that we need? And then the other thing is that, and this debate's about cities, so I'm not going to 
say otherwise, but that we constantly refer to the city as if the city was a separate beast from the rest of everything around it. When in fact, it's just a component part of everything around it. And so we should never isolate the city as a discussion point in, in, on its own, because everything else is part of the health and wealth of the city and everything beyond it, kind of. Yeah, it's true. It's like um, I often say, uh, tell younger people when we're working on things, that um, if we're making something new, say a new building, uh, there is metaphorically a hole somewhere out there in the earth that's equal to or larger than the stuff that we just made, because all that stuff that we made to make a new building comes from somewhere. So you can imagine an equal and opposite hole to the th structure we create. And of course, as that thing lives through time, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger because of the resources necessary to operate that thing that we made. And cities are very much like that. So I totally, uh, completely agree. And I know Maurizio also uh, and uh, sort of uh, alluded to that in the original comment that cities are nature and nature are cities. And, um, you know, it's, it's some kind of weird propaganda, to be honest, I, I'll use that word again. Um, I've even seen it where cities now, non-pandemic, pre-pandemic world, cities were, you know, and still are to a certain extent, competing with each other to get tourists, to get income, to get business, oh, wow. as if they are, yeah. So they'd propagandize their city as better than another city so that everyone would go there as uh, spend their tourist dollars and so on. Even to the point where for a while I had heard there were ideas floating around that say Paris would, would, would buy an airline and call it Paris Airlines and give free tickets to anybody who wanted to go to Paris on their Paris airline because they made more tax money from all the tourist dollars of all the people being there than the cost of the airline to operate, to fly people there. I mean, that's the kind of extreme version is of, a, uh, of propaganda. A is that a study that's been done? I mean, it sounds yeah. quite logical, if I'm honest. <laughs> you mean uh, buying air, you mean cities buying airlines? Say buying an up and uh, you know, you just fly people in from all over the planet. <laughs> I know. No, it never actually happened. I think it, it met some kind of, um, I don't know reasons of why it, it I, I'm sure there's a reason why it didn't happen, but yeah, you're right. I, it's good, but you know, it's, it, what, you know, not great for the ecology of the planet. No, no, it's horrible. And I mean, at one point in time, by the way, I, I read that at any moment in, in time and every second of the day, all day long, there were something like 450,000 people in the sky, yes. not with their feet on the ground. You know, and here's, the, a, here's a question for, for, for every one of us sitting here. Are we um, finding that this discussion that we are having about cities where we're all sitting in isolation works as well as if we would if we were all sitting in the same room in a city somewhere, being able to bounce off one another? Because fundamentally, we are now having to rationalize, reinvent how we work and live together in cities, but not all in the same city. Oh, Does anybody feel... That I'd be talking to more people if I were in a place. Right now I'm talking to a small group and then I'll, we'll yeah. split off and that's that. Poof will disappear. If, I were, if we were all in Tijuana, for example, we'd have more ability to talk with, directly with more people. The people there. Yeah. yeah. And so our voice and every view that we've got here in this discussion is devoid of the people who live in the city that we're talking about. Right. And, and so if this little group... This is, a, this is a little trick to get us over there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Tijuana, that's for sure. To go, yeah, I've, I've never been in Tijuana and I'd love to go there. Uh, I've However, been there many times. And so, and so I would like, if, if I'm going to discuss that city, I'd like to have dialogue with the people who live in that city. Yes. Otherwise, I'm just, I'm fabricating. But, but I think one of the things that the keys of, that arise in this conversation has to do with the size of the cycles of the city it means that the city is a system it depends on nature but the the size of the cycles means that we come with the energy from far away we bring the water from far away we get the trash far away and uh, and i think if we can close those cycles that would change dramatically for good the way the city operates and most of the issues that we just discussed yeah, 
is solved in, in a different way because what just Craig told about the, the construction, that materials flies or travels from all over the world to reservoir, I think if we can root with uh, our own basis, the materials, the natural resources, the food, the water and everything, this whole thing could be changed. And I think the education that Lucia was telling us about has to do with that. How can we be conscious? And, and you know, maybe, yeah. maybe it's old thinking to think that we've got to bring the water from somewhere else to, to the cities because, you know, where's the innovation in saying, well, let's think of it a different way. There's a great one in going to be in an expo about, I think it's a place in Chile or Peru where they need water and they don't have a lot of water, even though they're in mountain landscapes. And, and when you look at it, when, you know, um, when I've gone on field trips with, with you and Eduardo, there's the mist that hangs in all of the trees. Yeah, there's, there's a water harvesting. There, yeah. yeah, there's a guy there in a village who come up with nets that catch the water. Yes. So they have got these nets that strung from all the trees and he catches the water and that catchment is then fed to the village. So they don't need to go looking for water. They catch it from the very moisture that's in the environment that they live in. Is there ways of saying the city should be less reliant on bringing the goods and dumping its waste so that we've got the good bit comes in and the bad bit goes out? Is there yeah. more ways of thinking innovatively about if you have got inner cities and say, how do they create water? You know, how do they generate water? And even in a small way, if you go into your back garden, dig even, a hole. Uh, even if you, I mean, just look at all the buildings that get torn down or that are unused, you could at least recycle m yeah. many of the materials. But oftentimes there are laws that because a city is, uh, the real definition of a city is an, an administrative, a defined administrative area. So as soon as you put the administrative in that term, uh, then suddenly they, you got laws and you got legislation and those are harder. I mean, it was hard enough just to get some cities to think about how building envelopes need to change to accommodate solar energy and other things as opposed to property values and ownership, you know, and it, it's still very slow. But even just recycling materials there, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why people come up with it. That's just they're not going to allow it because there's too much litigation. And that's the other thing we we develop our cities around litigation now as much as we uh, develop them around uh, a quality of life. But I would say that Maurizio, uh, to answer your question in, 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 for me, uh, I would say there's two things we have to do. One of them is the science, you know, and take care of the science that we, we need to understand how to really properly manage things. But more importantly, in my mind, you're going to deal with climate abuse, long range problems like that that are uh, somewhat existential. You have to change people's connection to the world they live in quite literally, so that it's, doesn't, it's not a bad thing to walk in the rain. It's not a bad thing to have fresh air. It's not a bad thing to be a little hot, you know, when the sun comes out and it's hotter than you're used to. It's not a bad thing to be a little cold every now and then. I mean, 150 years ago, we could still have garden parties outside in the fall. Now, if you tell everybody, oh, let's have a garden party and it's, you know, below 69.368 degrees Fahrenheit. Everybody says, it's too cold. It's too cold. I can't go out there. So, you know, we've, we've lost our, and, and architecture does that. Architecture envelopes people. It gives us um, too much of a hygienic life. Uh, we, we forget what, it's, what stress means. And I agree with you. We have to get rid of stress, but we also need to keep some degree of stress in our lives to remind us that we're alive. And then uh, from there, we, uh, you know, we, we build up a logic that m helps people understand that the world isn't only about them. Because right now, all of us think the world is only about us. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Uh, what do you think, Lucia, from the educational point of view? How, how can we proceed in order to make conscious about all of this? So, so it could be like a collective mind that helps us to, to each other to be in a better shape that we are now. Yeah, I think that um, from the educational standpoint, I think I, I agree with both Alex and Craig uh, when they say that it, it's a matter of thinking how everything affects the other thing. 
So we cannot be thinking about ourselves all the time. And when governments go into um, their term, they cannot think about like, oh my God, how am I going to change everything that is already there? But we need to think about like the continuity of the things that have been done before and how we can improve that um, for the future. So specifically thinking about how, how to educate people on the topics of sustainability, on how the, how the sustainable development goals can be achieved by actions in the communities, how every one of, of us can take an action to actually help um, scientists and academia and government talk about these topics and even discussions such as this that can move forward the conversation towards what needs to be done. Um, it's super important. Um, but also I think that in terms of education, um, we need to also be sort of like relentless on the idea that everything we hear and that's another another documentary I saw recently on Netflix about the social dilemma, dilemma right? Um, everything that we see on our social media networks and our news feed every day and where, where, we're, where we're gathering information from is the same places that we already saw before because um, the technology is becoming um, more and more and more focused on what it takes for you to click an ad or to watch a video or um, give you information that you like. Or just uh, do this. So I'm not, sure that I'm, yeah. after this conversation, I'm going to be getting ads about flying to Tijuana. Just somehow they'll know <laughs> that I was on this. Yeah, the yeah. whole just kind of pop up there. Yeah, and so, so, the homogenization of, of all of that. Social so ideally, life. ideally, we could push ourselves to different conversations and difficult conversations also on how is it that we are ourselves not doing enough um, to make sure that our cities are becoming better and how we're not doing enough to connect with other places that are not where we live in. Um, so what, what Alex was saying, I, I thought it was amazing, right? Like what would this conversation be if we were not having it on a Zoom call, just the four of us, yeah. but if we were in a, in a, in the place that this Congress was supposed to happen in Tijuana with an mm -hmm. audience that could probably like interact with us and ask us different questions than what we're doing right now. Um, yeah. so just thinking outside of the box a little bit and thinking how we can push ourselves to be better and have these conversations with the people that we don't want to have the conversations with. But that's what makes us stretch our minds and stretch the possibilities of the future, which is what, why I think that um, cities of the future can be um, different and better. I, I have hope. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a natural, a natural that we would find ways to solve our problems. That's one thing that somehow humans manage to accomplish, even if they make a thousand mistakes in between. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll find a way as a, as a species. Sometimes, though, unfortunately, the problem is that it takes severe crisis uh, for us to really get into a positive action. And I guess that's the challenge. Will we be able to solve and, 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 and develop actions without severe crisis. But, you know, sometimes even the severe crisis, uh, as bad as it is, can create even better conditions. I mean, now that we're in a pandemic, there are a lot of people who are pointing out that classical Greece transformed from a uh, rather feudalistic society into the great uh, civilization that we know of today because of the Athenian uh, uh, pandemics and other uh, um, biological disasters that occurred there. So great, ch the Renaissance probably, you know, could be traced to various disease uh, configurations in, 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 in oh, Europe. The Roman, Roman Empire, the Roman Empire yeah. collapsed. Yeah, collapsed and rebuilt somehow the rest of the world. Yeah. Of life, you <laughs> yeah. know, so all we killed off, you know, the way they could supply to their armies. So they can yeah. no longer get supplies. They got out, the Roman Empire started to condense. Yeah. Kind of watching uh, or echoes of the Roman Empire, forgive me for putting it that way, of what happened then, and we're seeing it was happening. But the one thing I want to pick up here on this education thing, which is, I think, fundamental to the debate, the future of cities 
is not a city that I'm going to live in because I'm not going to be living when we start talking about the future of cities. Who is, who's alive today that's going to be living in the cities of the future? The kids. The children who live today are the future of the cities. And so when you get somebody like Greta who engages with the world and she's just a silly little girl until she creates a movement. Now, so there's a lot of value in actually respecting and listening to kids that have got a good education because they can be more innovative at times. It is their future that they're defining, not ours, because we ain't going to live it. So more credit has got to give and more trust has got to be given to younger um, kids is kind of what I think we should be driving towards. We can all be clever and educated, but somewhere down the line, innovation can be sparked from a child as much as it can from an adult. I think the key would be, Alex, in that sense, the ability to discern, because the education could be suck as sucking people, as Craig was saying. And I think the key is how to differentiate what is the roots and the, and the real thing from all the marketing and the, and the trends that are all over the places. And, yeah, which is a fixed point. Yeah. Well made. yeah. Whatever happens, it's going to take a hell of a lot of work. And my fear, uh, if I were to have one, and I'm uh, sort of, I guess I have, my, my mother's Jewish and my father's Catholic, so, you know, <laughs> I've got a lot of guilt. Um, the, uh, you know, my fear is that things like social media, which was raised earlier, are going to further refocus uh, um, people's uh, uh, thinking into more and more about them. I mean, that's why social media was invented. It was invented so that you, and the, that was a good thing, that you could keep track of your friends, you could, you know, your life could get sorted out. And that same mentality has now progressed to, um, you know, fighting social justice issues and fighting climate abuse issues, which I'm not going to say it hurts, but if we are not careful and you're not, like you said, Alex, not being there with real people in real time, it's going to be harder and harder because it takes yeah, a lot I mean, more work I, to be I, real. I, I, you know, as much as people don't like it sometimes, you know, inner cities and cities and people out in cities demonstrating is, is demonstrating a need for change in a very visual, visceral way that you don't get in social media. So right. what happens is people then take polarized views on yeah. people out on the streets but it's the people out in the streets that activate change to a degree. So sitting in your house, trying to do it through social media, you're never going to change the world that way. Yeah. And, and furthermore, all those computers that you're using are probably just as detrimental to the environment as burning plastic bags for a year in your backyard. <laughs> you're right. uh, yeah, there's a great one from a <laughs> commentator in uh, Australia who said when the kids are all talking about the environment and shit. So and then stop um, taking your car to school, your mother driving you to school yeah. and start walking. Yeah. Start cutting back on how often you use computers, and iPads and all of those things. Then you will start taking you seriously that yeah. you do want to change the world. I know, and it's the same with us. Same, same, same you know? with the elder generation. We have to get used to not being so comfortable in our you know, air conditioned homes. Yeah. And um, I, I think that um, to wrap up, because I think that we have only a couple of minutes left, I just wanted to say as well that the future of cities is also today. I think that a lot of people think that um, think of the sci-fi reality <laughs> that is going to happen when, where we're going to have flying cars and we're going to have like all of these other things. Uh, it's going to be like, well, um, it's already here, yeah. you know? Artificial, artificial intelligence, most um, in most um, parts, is running a lot of things that we use every day. Um, yeah. The flying cars exist in a, <laughs> in a yeah. in, in, exist as drones that are delivering it's, packages to your um, door. Seeing as seeing as time is running out, um, I don't know who's going to be listening to this, but if there's any feedback that they want, then the people on this panel, I am sure are willing to provide feedback to anybody who cares to ask 
a question beyond this little session to each an individual. Yeah. Well, the, the angel of the death is here, so we need to <laughs> finish it off. Uh, I can see him in the top corner. And, uh, but I think if we can summarize something quickly, it would be like to remain human, the principles that we need to follow in order to be thinking about the, the well-being of the continual wealth. And, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all of you guys to be here. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Jorge, for hosting us. So hopefully we'll get this feedback soon. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I thank you, every one of you. It's been, it's been fun. It's been intriguing. It's a wonderful conversation. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Thanks thank a you, lot. Bye. Okay. Take care, everyone. I'll I go and eat. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.